Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to day six of AABC's virtual annual meeting webinar series. I'm Sam Schwartz, a member engagement and marketing manager for AABC, and I'm happy everyone's here today. We'd also like to thank Instruments Direct for their support, and I was a big fan of that video. A few Zoom notes that I'd like to get into before we get started today. If you have questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A button in your Zoom window, uh, not the chat box there, and we will feed those questions to our speakers at the conclusion of the presentation. You can submit them at any time, so there's no need to wait until the end. And if you have technical issues, please use the chat box to inform us and we will take care of you. Today's presentation is hospital air balancing, planning and coordination case studies with Rebecca Ellis, Molly Meyer, and Miles Ryan. Rebecca is a mechanical engineer with more than 30 years experience with building systems and controls. She is president of Questions and Solutions Engineering and enjoys tackling unique and complex challenges for new and existing building commissioning clients. Molly is a mechanical engineer at Questions and Solutions Engineering with 22 years of experience specializing in management of commissioning large complex projects and healthcare facilities. She brings expertise in planning for successful facility management as well as new and existing building commissioning. And then finally, a little bit about Miles. He's a commissioning engineer at Questions and Solutions Engineering also, who has been involved in the commissioning of numerous projects in existing hospitals. As a major in the Air Force Reserves, he served as a mechanical systems instructor at the Air Force Institute of Technology at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. And with that, without stealing any more time today, I'm gonna hand it off to our presenters to take it away. And Rebecca, you might be muted, so if you just unmute yourself. Welcome everyone, this is Rebecca Ellis. QSC is a commissioning only firm whose work is premised on the fact that properly operating building systems are the result of well-planned and coordinated teamwork. One of the key collaborations, especially in complex facilities such as hospitals is with the TAB contractor. Today, we're going to delve deeply into two hospital renovation case studies and present our list of best practices for involving the test and balance contractor early and often. Next slide. We're gonna start with some background, including unique constraints involving working in occupied and operational healthcare facilities and a number of special compliance and owner's project requirements to be considered. We'll outline the best practices on which we want to focus and then spend most of the time presenting our case studies to demonstrate how those best practices can or should be applied. Next slide. So the learning objectives today are to one, identify the common challenges to the TAB process that existing hospitals present, explain the reason for an existing conditions assessment prior to project design, list the benefits of the TAB contractor performing a design review, and describe the items to be discussed in a TAB integration meeting. Now I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Molly and Miles who work together on both of the hospital projects we'll be presenting today. Healthcare is a continuously growing and changing industry. And so are the buildings that serve the patients, visitors, clinical staff, administration, and support staff. Many healthcare settings are a mix of old and new infrastructure fitting into tiny footprints. In any existing facility, the challenges and demands of healthcare design and construction are unique in detail, but generally fall into these main categories. Starting in design, the architects and engineers must gather information and provide the right amount of detail specific to the expected outcome and system performance for that project. Often large facilities have multiple project teams working simultaneously and coordination of current documentation must be sought out. As teams move into construction, there are constraints with working in existing facilities and planning ahead is required. Unforeseen existing conditions will be present and must be addressed, not ignored. The complexity and compliance requirements necessitate coordination between controls and the TAB contractors to satisfy system and space requirements. 
This is often implied, but not defined. Healthcare facility requirements are identified in codes and standards. Environmental conditions are driven by how the space is used. For some spaces, this is as simple as an airflow direction. In others, the requirement is for tight control to a specific pressure set point. For the most part, these requirements are clear and defined, but owners always have the option to require more specific or stringent requirements. Facility owners may have campus standards for the way compliance requirements are designed, maintained, and documented. Other facilities may leave it up to the design team on individual projects. Okay, so some of these owner's project requirements, which might be um, above and beyond the compliance requirements or supplemental to them, might include exceeding minimum requirements. So for instance, uh, the amount of ventilation provided to a space, um, there, there'll be compliance requirements, and then there might be, be owner's project requirements, which might be above and beyond that, especially during this time of COVID. Additionally, you might have air change power requirements for critical spaces, such as operating rooms, which you might have compliance requirements at one value, but an owner's project requirements might be a, quite a bit higher. They might have standardized um, alarming that they want to see. So for instance, um, when, when to alarm certain variables, temperature, pressure, humidity, at what thresholds do we alarm? When do we delay or suppress those alarms? Um, and also they might have requirements on what alarms are um, provide remote notifications and which ones have local enunciations. So for instance, if you have an operating room, if the temperature or humidity falls outside of tolerance and alarm needs to be generated, um, maybe it's not best to uh, generate that alarm and, and enunciate it to the, to the surgeon right then and there. It's probably best to relay that alarm remotely to the building operated, operation staff so they can address it. But maybe more critical alarms like a lack of pressure or not meeting the air change per hour requirements for a particular operating room may require local enunciation both visually and, aud and audibly. Um, and that might be a facility standards requirement or an order owner's project requirement. That owner might have failure responses, sticking with that concept of like an operating room. We've worked on projects where if a presser, pressure sensor or an airflow sensor um, on the system serving the space falls out of calibration or, or fails and it gives some erroneous reading. We can, we've programmed it where we can identify that it must have failed and implement a failure response. So if they're under the knife and it's currently occupied in the operating room and a sensor fails, the building automation system can go to default damper positions on the return valve as well as the supply, supply VAV box, um, which those positions have been determined by a tab contractor to provide adequate pressure to maintain the space pressure requirements until they get through surgery and they can come in and address that failure point. Planning for sustainable operations is very critical when it comes to healthcare. So we put a lot of time and effort, all of us on this webinar speaking to you and the attendees, we put a lot of effort into delivering our owners, our clients, projects that are operating to their requirements. Now we want those operations to be sustained for the life of, the, um, of that building. That is often not the case, but one way we can ensure sustained operations would be to accurately document stuff. So accurately document um, the tab report. The tab report has to have all the information that is gonna be valuable for them to continue with sustained operations. Same with the temperature controls record drawings and all of the as-built documentation, closeout documentation from a project. The owner's project requirements might require coordination between multiple simultaneous projects and different project teams. The project that comes to mind, something we recently did where we were working on a project, a bunch of terminal units served by a specific air handling unit. That particular project, that renovation project, um, wasn't touching the air handling unit, but it was touching the terminal units being served. That was one project team one design firm, one um, general contractor, but there was a simultaneous project doing upgrades to that serving air handling unit that was going on at the same time, different design firm, different construction team. Um, we as a commissioning provider were actually on both projects, uh, but obviously there's a lot of coordination uh, 
that has to happen between those two entities that add, adds a level of complexity. Um, but that is often an older project requirement that we've seen in existing hospitals. Some of the best practices, which I'm just going to outline them here, but that we're going to walk through some case studies, give you better examples, and at the end we'll come in and hit one of these points, or each, each and every one of these points in greater depth. So we're going to say a best practice is to do an existing conditions assessment prior to design. These existing hospitals, some of them are very old. There's a, there's a lot of stuff up there above the ceiling that needs to be looked at uh, prior to even getting into the design phase. Otherwise, you're just going to run into more and more issues as you go into the construction phase. Design documentation needs to be very detailed, detailing the constraints, the constraints that the tab contractor, the controls contractor, the commission provider have to work within when it comes to the end of the project and we're doing our best to make sure that the project requirements are being met. How much room, how much flexibility do we have to play with the airflow set points? Can we deviate from scheduled values up or down? Well, a lot of the information given us how much flexibility we have to make sure that we're meeting the pressure requirements or airflow requirements of a space um, is often uh, lacking, but it is needed in our case studies. We'll detail that here in a little bit. A customized tab specification is really needed for every project out there. We see so much cut and paste in this industry, not just for the tab specification, but for so much, right? And uh, we're, we're here to advocate that a customized tab specification is always necessary. Um, but is absolutely necessary, especially when you're working in existing hospitals, healthcare renovations, which just add this whole level, whole extra level of complexity. We're going to talk about the importance of a tab integration meeting. That's an integration meeting that we have towards the end of the construction project, just prior to tab coming in and doing their field work. And then consolidated accurate as well documentation from us who are on the project team to make sure that the owners, the the operators of the building going forward have all that information to make sure that those operations are sustainable for years to come. Also, that information is going to be a good reference point the next time they touch this system on, a, on the next renovation or upgrade project. Our case studies today are both from the same healthcare campus. Original buildings date back to the early 1900s with three major additions from 1910 to 1954. Today, it's difficult to see the boundary lines of those early additions. More recent additions were clearly defined buildings added to the campus in 1975, 1986, and 2005. Currently, the campus is roughly 3 million square feet with 680 patient beds. Our first case study uh, today, um, excuse me, our first case study is located in a building that was built in 1975. The building is occupied by, occupied by patients on two floors, lobby, imaging suites, outpatient kitchen and cafeteria, as well as offices and meeting rooms are located on the remaining three floors. This building has often been considered for demolition during master planning of the campus. And as a result, there are significant deferred upgrades. Several of the air handling units were located in the lower level serving floors above. The remaining air handling units are located on the roof. In the small lower level mechanical room, there was no space to install new equipment while leaving the existing equipment operational. The solution was to consolidate the lower level air handling units into a single large air handling unit on the roof. Where possible, existing shafts were utilized. On the lower level air handling units, um, only the lower level air handling units would be removed as part of the project, but the new air handling unit was sized to handle the load of the remaining existing units at some point in the future. Okay, so what does it look like? Molly kind of, she, she explained that the four story building here, right? The lower level, the first floor and the second floor, we're all gonna have their air handling unit units demolished as part of this project. And we're gonna consolidate all those airflow requirements into a customized rooftop unit located on the roof. So how do we do that? So here's the rooftop unit up here. We got return risers, which are pulling the return air from the spaces, goes through the rooftop unit. This is a variable air volume, dual duct system. So you have a cold deck going over here down this existing shaft, which is interior to the, the building envelope. 
you have a hot deck that goes down with it. This cold deck and hot deck going through this shaft are gonna tie in to the existing horizontal air distribution systems on the first and second level of this building. Okay, you also have another cold deck that comes off this side, goes all the way over here and it goes down an exterior shaft, exterior to the building envelope. Eventually it's gonna make its way inward and it's gonna to get to the lower level, in which case it's going to branch into two. One's gonna remain a cold deck. The other one's gonna have a duct mounted steam heating coil and turn it into a hot deck. And then those hot decks and cold decks are gonna tie into the lower level existing air distribution system. So as we work our way down, floor four, we're not tying in anything here yet. In the future, we're gonna tie into the air distribution system on floor four, but for now it's serving air handling units gonna remain. You can see the shafts, the vertical shafts there. Same with floor three. It's only on floor two where we start to tie in out here into the existing hot and cold decks for the horizontal air distribution system serving this floor. Same thing on first floor. It's from this shaft that we're gonna be tying into the existing hot deck and cold deck air distribution systems serving first floor. And then it's only at the lower level where we're going to, this one right here is your cold deck. That's a return duct. So here's your cold deck. It's going to come and it's going to split into two. It's going to split into a hot deck and a cold deck. So we're going to have a duct mounted steam heating coil. And then those hot decks and cold decks are going to be tied into the existing horizontal air distribution system serving the lower level. A couple of pictures of the project. Here's a couple crane picks of uh, different sections of the customized air handling unit going, or the customized rooftop unit going up on the roof. Uh, pretty exciting project for me. This is the biggest uh, rooftop unit I had to work with today, uh, to date, and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. There were several sections. That's just one of many that had to get put together uh, to put this thing together up on the roof. Here's a couple more pictures of them installing the vertical risers that were exterior to the building envelope. So here's the return riser coming back from levels one and two. Here's the cold deck and return riser leading to and from the lower level. All right, so some tab considerations. So this project, we're tying into existing air distribution systems. However, we're gonna do nothing with the existing terminal units. We know that they are uh, dual duct boxes, variable air volume boxes. Um, and we know that uh, in a lot of instances, they're not operating too well. We've, we've talked to people, we, we, we've done some, some work in the building and we know that some of the pneumatic lines have been cut and they're just pneumatically controlled and it's just not working at all. But that was outside the scope of this work or outside the scope of this project. This project wanted us to do no harm. So we needed to make sure that this new system, this consolidated rooftop unit supplies the same, if not more airflow to all of the terminal boxes. So how are we gonna do that? We don't really have any information on the terminal boxes. It was deemed outside of the scope, outside of budget to go and take airflow measurements at all of these terminal boxes. Also, we had to account for seasonal considerations. So what we did is we sent the tab contractor in there to take pre-construction tab readings. And what he did is he took airflow readings and static pressure readings at each of the takeoffs for, from each riser. So the main supply hot deck and main supply cold deck for each level had airflow and static pressure readings taken. Now this was done in the summer and the project was gonna be completed during the fall and winter. And you know the, the post-construction tab work is gonna be performed in the winter. So clearly in the winter, we can't just balance the system to make sure that we get the same airflows because hot, hot deck airflow is gonna be much higher in the winter than it was in the previous summer when the pre-construction tab readings were taken. So what we did is we took the static pressure readings and we balanced the system to make sure that we got the same, if not more static pressure available at each of the takeoffs serving each floor's horizontal air distribution system. So not perfect by any means, um, but given the limitations of the project, uh, it was kind of decided that's, that's the best we could do. And that was really a starting point. We know that in the future, there's gonna be more work done on this. We're gonna tie in levels three and four. Additionally, we're, there's a project in the years ahead where they're gonna replace all of the terminal boxes um, with DDC, bring those boxes onto an automation system. And they already have a plan to implement um, some more sophisticated static pressure set point reset sequences to make sure that we uh, zero in on the appropriate control of the su supply fan, supply fan array up in the rooftop unit, um, as well as to be able to identify where airflows 
airflow is lacking in certain spaces and have the tab contractor come back and address those at that time. Some additional tab considerations. How are we doing building pressure control? We were actually doing total building pressure control indirectly. We did it by use of the way we controlled the return fan. So the return fan was gonna to control to an airflow offset. So we're measuring supply airflow at every, you know, with an airflow measuring station. We're measuring return airflow with an airflow measuring station. And we're controlling the return fan array to make sure that the return airflow is some offset value, some set point less than the measured supply air airflow. Okay, so the issue with this is we didn't tie in levels two, one, and the lower level all on the same day. In fact, it was like a month apart each time. And tying in the hot deck and cold deck for a given level was also not on the same day. There was often several days to a week in between there as well. So it was a very phased project. So we had to work in close coordination with the design engineer to say, you know, for a starting point, what's like the appropriate airflow offset we should be using during each of these, these phases. And ultimately they had to send the tab contractor out there to identify locate and identify as well as measure all of the exhaust air systems on those floors being served. So the tab contractor went out there actually during the pre-construction phase, found all the exhaust air systems, took their floor readings. So we knew how much air, air was being exhausted from each of these floors. And we used that to kind of establish like at least a starting point for what that airflow, um, return airflow offset value should be. Additionally, that's how we did, so basically return fan control, that's how we did pressure control for the building as a whole, but we wanna make sure we were returning the appropriate amount of airflow from each level. We didn't wanna return all of the airflow from level two and none of the airflow from level one because that's gonna create you know, chimneys going up the, the stairwells or the elevator shafts and whatnot. So we want to pro pull the appropriate amount of airflow back from each of these levels. Now, clearly we would typically do that by adjusting balancing dampers at the return takeoffs. That was not an option here. Space limitations uh, did not, not allow for it. So the design engineer, his approach was, we're not gonna install balancing dampers at each of those takeoffs. Instead, we already have fire and smoke dampers that are required to be there. Um, and we're going to set the open position during occupied, when the system's actually running, right? We're gonna set the open position of these fire and smoke dampers to some value that needs to be determined by the tab contractor to make sure we get appropriate airflow being pulled from each of these floors. So that was actually kind of a unique thing that I've never worked with before. Um, it actually probably made the tab contractor's job a little bit easier because the temperature controls contractor was with them with a laptop and adjusting set points and he was taking measurements. Um, they could make their adjustments and that iterative process went a lot quicker. Um, however, there's obviously a lot more coordination that needs needed to take place during that. We needed to make sure that, that the final settings for each of those return dampers was clearly communicated to the controls contractor. They hard programmed it into the program, they hard coded it into the controls programming, as well as all that information was clearly documented in the closeout documentation because those values are gonna be needed going forward and they're probably gonna be adjusted uh, in future, future work that's gonna happen on this system in this building. Some of the best practices. So we already talked about the five best practices in the list, but how do they apply to this particular project? Existing conditions assessment, clearly taking those pre-construction pre tab airflow readings, absolutely necessary. Design documentation, detailing constraints. That is the design engineer clearly identifying to us during each phase of this project, during each tie-in, what would be the appropriate minimum outdoor airflow requirements? What is the appropriate return airflow offset set point? A customized tab specification is always required, but in this case, clearly this is a pretty unique project. The tab process was a little unconventional. Um, so that had to be, uh, that was identified early on that they needed to provide more direction on this tab specification, which they did. The tab integration meeting, we actually had multiple tab integration meetings. This was a kind of a point of contention as to how we were gonna do this. And we had to get all, all the key players in there and make sure that everyone was in agreement with the, the approach we were gonna take. And then as well documentation. Clearly we have more projects coming up, touching this system and having a good solid documentation of what we did during this project is gonna be vital for the success and the efficiency of future projects. Okay, our second case study is located in a building built in 1956. The driving factor for the project is an upgrade to the pharmacy as required by US Pharmacopeia 
or otherwise known as USP. These upgrades include maintaining a high level of air changes and cascading pressure requirements within a specific range, 0.01 to 0.03 inches water column in either positive or negative, depending on the space type. This inpatient pharmacy is landlocked in the middle of the original buildings where existing conditions are highly variable. The air handling unit serving the pharmacy is original to the building, vintage 1956, uh, but the controls and various components of the air handling unit have been upgraded over the years. The project scope was limited to specifically address the USP requirements and portions of the pharmacy not under construction had to remain open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. At the time of this project, there is a specific timeline for pharmacies to meet the new requirements. In addition, the project had to bring in portable pharmacy, a portable pharmacy during construction. And this portable pharmacy was scheduled to be uh, moved from one site to the next. Each project within the healthcare system needed to stay on schedule in order to avoid impacting other projects. All right, so let's lay out what this system looks like. Existing hospital, many, many years old, existing pharmacy space, and we're renovating just a portion of the space, these colored boxes here. As Molly talked about, one of the USP requirements was for cascading pressure requirements, which gets complicated. So let's kind of explain it a little bit. So these cascading pressure requirements were as follows. The space, room 1411 in green there, that needs to be maintained at a positive pressure in relation to the existing pharmacy space. Additionally, 1413 and room 1414 needs to be maintained at a positive pressure in relationship to 1411. And then lastly, 1412 needs to be, needs to be maintained at a negative pressure in relationship to 1414. Okay, so how are we gonna maintain all these pressure requirements? Well. As part of this renovation, this remodel, clearly there's a lot of work done with the mechanical systems. So mechanical systems were put in place to allow for pressure control in each one of these spaces. Now, there is supply air being provided to all these spaces and there's either return air or exhaust air for most of them as well. So depending on the space, I think two of the spaces we controlled for space pressure by modulating a return valve, how much air is being sucked out of the space. And then the other two spaces we are controlling for space pressure by use of modulating the amount of supply air going into that space. So mechanisms were put in place for pressure control. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the constraints of this building. This was an existing hospital and above the hardened ceiling in all of the, in this whole area was like a rat's nest. There was like no room for anything. Um, in addition to that, the serving air handling unit, which supplies air to these spaces and extracts air from these spaces was existing and of questionable um, performance. So there's a lot of limitations right off the bat for the design team. So what they opted to do is let's get by with providing the minimum amount of air from the air handling unit to these spaces and extracting the minimum amount of air from these spaces and bringing it back to the air handling unit. If we can minimize that, Therefore, we can minimize the size of the ductwork and it's to make it a lot easier to be able to, to do this, this remodel with the limited space we have above the hardened ceilings in these spaces. Okay, so if they're just providing the minimum requirements to meet ventilation, these spaces also had air change per hour requirements. The air change per hour requirements were then gonna be met by these fan filter units. So these fan filter units are, is a fan that recirculates air within a given space across a HEPA filter and they can be used, the amount of airflow they're using can be used to meet the air change per hour requirements for a given space. So I only show one fan filter unit in each of these spaces here, but actually each of them had anywhere from like two to five. Some of the fan filter units were existing some of them were new as part of this project. And all these fan filter units were gonna be located above the hardened ceiling, up in that really tight space, right? That, that plant them up above the hardened ceiling. Their supply air was gonna be ducted into the space below, but we didn't have room for return air duct work. So therefore they were gonna use an open plenum return concept. So there was gonna be grills, which basically, excuse me, allowed for air to float up from the space below up into the plenum space above the hardened ceiling 
And that plenum space is going to then be used as like a giant duct or an open plenum to bring the air back to the suction side of the fan filter unit. So that was the approach. And that open plenum concept actually came back to bite us a little bit. Let me explain. So at the end of the project, first the temperature controls contractor came in there. He dropped his programming. He programmed everything to spec. And I can say that because eventually I got in there and I was able to, to do the functional performance testing and to confirm that. Even though his programming all checked out, the, temp the pressure control, this cascading pressure relationships were not being maintained. When the TAP contractor came in there, he found that 1413 and 1414 were negative in relation to 1411. The reason they were negative is because 1411 was excessively pressurized in relationship to the existing pharmacy space. So 1411 was supposed to be controlling to 0 0.025 inch water gauge compared to the existing pharmacy space. It was something on the order of 0 0.08 inch water gauge. So this green space was drastically overpressurized. Therefore, we couldn't build up the pressure in 1413 or 1414 to be above it. So that was obviously the trigger. We needed to bring that back in compliance first, and hopefully everything is going to work out after that. So the TAB contractor, who really was the MVP in this project, um, did a lot of investigation trying to figure out what was going on here. What he found is the supply air coming in from the air handling unit was actually right on design. And above this space, in this open plenum, not only was it an open plenum return for the fan filter units, but it was also in that open plenum where the return valve, which sucked air back to the air handling unit was located. So he took measurements at the return valve and found that it's actually extracting more airflow than design. So it's extracting more airflow than design. You would think we would be pulling negative pressure in the space, but that was not the case. We were excessively overly pressurized. Now, what it was, was that open plan return concept, that space above the hardened ceiling in 1411 was becoming excessively negatively pressurized. You have four or five fan filter units, which are creating a suction pressure because they're sucking air out of that open plenum and pushing it down into 1411. You also have that return valve, which is sucking a lot of air out of it. And that negatively pressurized plenum was actually sucking air in from adjacent spaces like the existing pharmacy because the walls right here, follow my cursor, the walls right here were existing walls. And those existing walls, everything below the hardened ceiling was cleaned up nice during the construction project, right? New sheetrock, painted, it looked really pretty. Above the hardened ceiling, nothing was looked at or touched or improved. And the tab contractor got up there and found that there were very leaky walls. So they were sucking air in above the, above the hardened ceiling from the existing pharmacy space. The fan filter units was then pushing that air down into the space, 1411, which was overpressurizing 1411. So what did they do to fix it? They came in there, general contractor, patched up all the walls above uh, the drop, above the hardened ceiling along this whole perimeter here. In addition, they put in two more return grills, which allowed for an easier path from air to flow from 1411 up into that open plenum return. So here's a couple of pictures of what they're looking at, looking at above the hardened ceiling. That actually doesn't even do it justice, but clearly it wasn't sealed right there. This was like an inch and a half diameter hole there. Um, and they were kind of all over the place. So it actually took them several days to go up there and get all this, you know, it's hard to get in there, but um, once they patched it all, once they patched it all and, and provided those additional return grills to allow the air to more easily float up into the open plenum from 1411, we were able to bring 1411's pressure back into uh, controlling on set point. Now, once we did that, we had no problem getting 1411 to go positive. We had no problem with getting 1414 to go positive. However, the next step is we had an issue getting 1412 to go negative. So how 1412's pressure control worked was it was set up to modulate the amount of supply air coming in by the supply VAV box. We're going to modulate the amount of supply air to maintain pressure at set point. And the design documentation had a range of air flows that we could work between. And it was actually pretty limited, only like a couple hundred CFM deviation between minimum airflow and maximum airflow set points for that VAV box. And even at the minimum airflow being provided to 1412, 
we still couldn't get this space negative. So we had to drop this pressure even more. Well, the issue there is if we drop it too much, now we're gonna not be in compliance with the ventilation requirements for that particular space. So we had to reach back while we were on, on site that day, we had to reach back to the design engineer. He had to look back at his calculations for what were the ventilation requirements for that space to make sure that any adjustments we did did not take us out of compliance for ventilation. Okay, so tab considerations. I kind of talk to all of this, um, but here's are some of the tab considerations for this particular pharmacy project. And, uh, and yeah, I guess ultimately kind of the big takeaway here is that open plan return, um, using open plan return for cascading pressures where each room has its own pressure control and they need to maintain a relationship with each other, um, made it a very difficult, uh, very difficult for us to to achieve it, but in the end, but in the end we got there. It just took us a little bit longer than we intended to. So some of the best practices, all the best practices we outlined before, also apply to this particular project. The existing conditions assessment, um, in my mind, it was done. It wasn't like hindsight. It wasn't done as thoroughly as it should have been. Um, we should have been looking at those walls uh, and the condition of those walls, those partitions above the hardened ceiling. We would have saved ourselves a lot of trouble at the end of the project had we identified that early on. Design documentation detailing constraints. That goes back to the example of at the very end there where I was, where I was saying I wanted to further reduce the airflow being sent into 1414 um, to make sure we got that space negative enough. Well, we didn't know what the ventilation requirements were. We didn't know how much we could reduce that airflow and we had to stop call a design engineer, track him down. He had to go back to his office, check it out. And it, and it delayed the process. It de delayed the functional performance testing of that particular, um, of, the, of the space as a whole. And now had that clearly been identified um, early on, it would have been helpful and have been more of a seamless um, process at the end. Customized tab specification, as always, tab integration meeting, there was actually numerous tab integration meetings. Um, some of them were impromptu based on the, the issues we, were, we found in that I kind of highlighted there. Um, but that tab integration meeting, make sure everyone kind of understands um, the requirements, everyone's, under, everyone's various requirements for the tab contractor and what he requires or he or she requires from everyone else before he, can, he or she can adequately do their job. And then as built documentation is absolutely necessary. So for instance, on this particular project, um, we got the space pressures, the cascading pressure relationships to work out. However, it was a delicate balance. Many adjustments were needed. It was a several day process to get there um, because of the existing conditions nature of this, of this project. Um, it had to be clearly documented where we landed and what were the conditions that allowed us to land there? What were the pressure set points that allowed us to land there? What were the airflow set point ranges that the VAV boxes or the return valves were allowed to modulate in between? What was the static pressure set point of the serving air handler supply fan? What was the static pressure set point that the return fan of the serving air handler was controlling to? All that information needed to be clearly documented. So if they run into issues in the future and they start getting pressure alarms in the space, Facility operations can look back on this as built documentation, make sense of it, and make use of it. So, some of the best practices that we've been talking about are here. I think we should take some time to walk through each one of them and explore in a little bit more detail. Existing conditions assessment. I mean, clearly, the design engineer who's going to be designing this renovation or retrofit is going to be part of this. And, and they often are part of it, right? Or they often are doing something to an extent. But we would advocate that other individuals get invited to this party as well. Hopefully the commissioning provider comes there, the tab contractor, maybe even the temperature controls contractor comes there to take a look at um, the existing conditions assessments, as well as other members of the um, construction team. Because everyone comes with a different perspective, different experiences, and you'll be able to identify potential issues much earlier on. And you know, the earlier we identify issues, uh, it's a, the cheaper it is, right? It's gonna be a lot cheaper to address those issues than design as opposed to at the end of a project. Additionally, you could identify requirements for scope modifications. Now everyone kind of balks at that. Maybe it's scope creep. Maybe we expand the scope of the project, but if it makes sense to do so, maybe you expand the scope of the project 
the price goes up. However, the, the facility staff, the capital projects can avoid another capital project two to three years down the road. Um, and, and in the end, it could be a lot more cost effective if you address certain requirements during this project you're on right now. And then lastly, it's gonna allow it to familiarize the team with the area of the upcoming construction. All right, design documentation, detailing constraints, right? So we're asking more information to be provided in the design documentation. So when the tab contractor, controls contractor, commissioning provider are in there at the end of the project and they need to make adjustments, they need to deviate in airflow set points slightly from what was scheduled, how much deviation, how much play do they have to work with? What is level of flexibility do they have at their disposal to get these systems to operate the way they're intended to do? Additionally, it might be beneficial um, for them to, for the design engineers to document uh, existing system limitations. So one project that comes to mind is we did several operating rooms, renovated several operating rooms. Um, we were just gonna be working at the terminal device level, right, in the operating room itself, the return valves, the supply airflow, airflow valves. Um, however, we were not gonna be touching the existing serving air handling unit. But we identified during the initial con conditions, our existing conditions walk through that the ducted system for the return, return fan was really restrictive. And, you know, doing this renovation of the operating room, putting more changes per hour, putting more supply area into those rooms, um, we're going to in turn have to extract more air from the return fan. And we had a really restrictive system. And it was identified early on that we might drastically overpressurize these operating rooms um, if we don't do anything about this ducted return path. And this was identified to the owner. They opted not to address it during the project, but it was clearly identified in the design documentation that we might run into a situation where we're not able to control pressure and it might build higher than intended in that particular operating room. That's exactly what happened. But since it was clearly identified and, and communicated to the owner early on, there was no finger pointing going on at the end. We just had to chalk it up and document it at the end that this was identified early on. We did run into it. and. Oh, by the way, we suggest that you address it on your next project touching this air handling unit. Another example of design documentation detailing constraints would be that same operating room renovation. We had the facility, uh, facility standards wanted 20 air changes per hour for um, during, during a surgery, right? So occupied operating room during surgery, occupied mode, they wanted 20 air changes per hour. Okay, so the design engineer selected a VAV box that's gonna provide, you know, selected it for 20 air changes per hour. And then the sequence of operation called for alarming if the airflow fell below 20 air changes per hour for two minutes. And we had to come back to them and said, okay, you want us to control to 20 air changes per hour. And you want us to alarm if we go directly, immediately below 20 air changes per hour. It's like, we should either lower the alarm threshold to like 18 air changes per hour, or we alarm at 20, but we control to something like 22 or 23 air changes per hour. What is it going to be? So that information needs to be clearly documented or those questions need to be asked of the design engineer, as opposed to a tab contractor or commission provider or temperature controls contractor from just arbitrarily making that decision, right? We need to need to understand the compliance requirements and the design engineers in the best position to specify what the difference should be between control point and alarm threshold. A customized tab specification. It needs to require the tab contractor to do a design review prior to construction, right? Uh, like get them in early. Like for commissioning, we always say, bring commissioning provider in as early as you possibly can on a project. Same thing with TAB, um, especially for these complex healthcare projects. Bring TAB in early, have them do a design review before you enter into the construction phase. Additionally, um, provide project-specific and system-specific balance requirements. In our case studies before, like clearly those were, especially that first one with that air system consolidation, like it's kind of like unique balancing process, right? It's a little bit different than the conventional balancing process. So a lot of guidance and a lot of direction needs to be provided to that tab contractor to make sure he understood the designer's intent uh, and the owner's intent and what we're trying to get to in the end. Also in this tab specification, we have to talk about the uh, 
reporting requirements. If you have a phased project, right? We, we worked on a different project at a different healthcare system recently. Um, that was three or maybe five years in duration and it was very phased. So only the air handling unit served a little bit more space this month, five months later, we added to it. And the air handling unit had to keep on providing air to more and more spaces, very phased projects. So what were the tab you know, on-site requirements? What, what were they balancing? And what were they gonna go back and rebalance at different phases? And then what was the reporting documents for each one of those phases? And then finally, for like that final tab report, like what the information is displayed and how it's displayed is very important. So the healthcare system that our case studies came out of very specific requirements for what information is provided and how it's provided because we want to match how this information is displayed. We want to match that to the building automation systems graphic for sustained operations. So if the facility operations staff is getting a bunch of pressure alarms in the pharmacy, which this is an excerpt from the pharmacy's tab report, if they get a bunch of pressure alarms in that space, you know, six months after the project is complete, they can pull up their BAS graphic, they can compare pressure readings to what we found in the tab report, they can compare, well, what's going on here? Why are we not maintaining pressure? Oh, for some reason, we had changed the supply fan static pressure set point down to 0.3 inch water gauge. Okay, let's well, return to 0.75 because that's what the tab report said. They were able to get the cascading pressure requirements to be met with 0.75 inch water gauge static pressure set point. And then maybe they restore that and maybe it all comes back into play, right? So having all this information that's critical to the operation of these systems clearly displayed, standardized and have it match the building automation system graphics can be vitally important for sustained operations. Tab integration meeting. What do we mean by tab integration meeting? We're talking about a meeting with all of the key players at the end of the project, just prior to the field work being done by the tab contractor. All right, who's gonna who needs to be in attendance? General contractor for sure, mechanical contractor, commissioning provider. Should I say it? Tab contractor has to be invited. I've been to one of these where a tab contractor didn't show up. Not a very effective tab integration meeting at all. Design team needs to be there. The owner needs to be there. The controls contractor needs to be there. And what's gonna be discussed at this tab integration meeting? Well, first off, when's it gonna happen? Towards the end of the project, but after a controls integration meeting. So one of our standard practices is on all of our projects, we hold controls integration meetings. What do we do at controls integration meetings? We get the temperature controls contractor in there with the design team, with the commissioning provider, but also with any vendors or suppliers of equipment with like onboard controllers that needed to interface to the automation system. And we put them in there and we ask the questions to facilitate that conversation to make sure, okay, chiller provider, you have an onboard controller. What is your onboard controller exactly controlling and what is expected to be controlled by the building automation system? How are they communicating with each other? What points needs to be written, which are just monitored? All of those conversations need to be facilitated during a controls integration meeting. During that controls integration meeting, it is probably gonna be identified what set points are gonna to need to be determined by the tab contractor when they're on site during their field work. So it's only after the controls integration meeting is it appropriate to have a tab integration meeting because it is the controls integration meeting that is oftentimes identifying requirements, required information that has to be provided by the tab contractor. Okay, that second point kind of goes along with that. This meeting is gonna be allowed to consolidate all the tab requirements, right? So the tab requirements might be laid out in the design drawings, some of it in the tab specification. Some of it will, will never be thought of, the requirements for the tab will never be thought of until the controls integration meeting. Some of it may be um, identified during change orders throughout the project that the tab contractor may or may not be aware of. So having everyone in that meeting to talk about it and make sure that all of the requirements, all of the information the tab provider has to identify and provide is clearly consolidated. Establish or really reaffirm the documentation expectations and the timelines for submission of preliminary tab reports. All right, documentation expectations should be clearly laid out in a customized tab specification. The timelines for, for submission um, really need to be reiterated at this point as well because us as commissioning providers, in most instances, we don't wanna come and do functional performance testing until 
temperature controls contractor. It's got all the programming downloaded, checked it out. The tab contractor came in there and did all their work and their meeting flows or flows are, you know, meeting the design requirements. The list of systems and equipment need to be to be balanced, need to be talked about in this meeting because it may have grown or shrunk based off of change orders throughout the project. Confirmation of the balancing process for complex integrated systems. I said before that that consolidated air system project that had a uh, that had many tab integration meetings because we all had kind of our own opinions on how it should be done. And we eventually found consensus and we kind of zeroed on what the team agreed was probably the best approach given our limitations. There may be requirements to, to take measurements of the system during different modes of operation. So for instance, that pharmacy project, that pharmacy project had a, an air handling unit which was serving an adjacent space adjacent to the entire pharmacy, right? So if that air handler went down from failure or you know, a, a planned outage for maintenance, what have you, if that went down, how did that affect the pressure requirements in that pharmacy? So we tested that and we had the tab contractor there for that testing uh, to take measurements because that will help inform facility staff whether or not they have to shut down that pharmacy when they work on the air handling unit serving the adjacent space in the future. Coordination with packaged equipment startup and documentation, we kind of talked about that. And then clearly coordination with the controls contractor because they're so intertwined. And then lastly, as well documentation, like we're crazy about documentation. We want to, you know, for a healthcare system, there's a lot going on. So let's make it easy for them. Let's make these operations sustainable. So let's, you know, be consistent in the way you document stuff. Um, if you're working with healthcare staffs, you know, advocate that they get a standardized facility guideline specification that that requires as-built documentation, close out documentation in certain formats and make sure that that lines up with the information being displayed on the building automation system and things of that nature. All right, that does it for us. Um, Sam, are there any questions? Yes, there? we have uh, quite a few questions coming in, so I'll try to feed them to you. First one is, if we have an operation theater room and we make a balance of supply and return CFM as per design, but still we can't reach to negative pressure required, what can we do? I'll jump in on that one. So um, operating rooms are driven by air changes on the supply. And so in that particular case, um, reducing the amount of return to build up pressure would not impact the, um, the requirements for air changes, but would allow increase in pressure. So that would be, that would be the first item. And then um, of course, you know, why can't that offset maintain the pressure uh, going back to some of the things that Miles talked about in terms of how well is the room sealed and that is above ceiling conditions, as well as looking at the doors. Um, oftentimes space around um, the doors, the sweeps, um, that kind of thing. That's kind of typical balancing um, things that you might look at, but um, oftentimes there's uh, big holes to be considered as well if if it was thought that you could maintain pressure with an offset of 200 CFM, but you need 800, um, likely there's something else going on. Thanks, Molly. So the next question is, how old are the systems serving the third and fourth floors and when are they anticipated to upgrade? So those systems are of the same vintage uh, installed in 1975 and um, the the project to um, bring those um, over um, is, not, is not yet planned. Um, those particular floors are behavioral health. And so there's some level of difficulty um, with any kind of downtime there. Um, but this campus, like I said, there's a lot of uh, master planning going on and they have some projects that are taking priority um, over those two floors right now. Is it okay to use the smoke damper as a balancing damper? I saw those questions coming in. Uh, there were several questions about that. And yes, it's a very unique situation, but it can be done without impacting the UL listing of the, the combination damper. 
Um, the fire alarm has to remain in control of power to the actuator, but the controls can um, be put um, in line um, so that if there is power to that circuit, um, the controls can command the damper to a specific position. And anytime the fire alarm needs to close that damper, um, it will do so and uh, bypass the building automation controls. So I would say that it is not an ideal situation um, because it's a little bit complicated and down the line, anyone who wasn't involved in the project may have a hard time understanding what's happening there. Um, and should someone modify it more, um, like you said, there's a risk uh, on that UL listing, but um, it can be done. So for case study two, any pressure control issues associated with air supply slash return in the spaces surrounding the pharmacy, such as the corridors, and then they wrote also any impact from elev elevator lobby. Mm -hmm. um, in general, does the design require tab to note the operating conditions of adjacent and potentially unrelated air devices? So in case study two, the, the area that was being worked on was really landlocked. Um, and I mentioned that earlier, but in this case, it had no corridors or really much of um, uh, adjacent spaces impacting it other than the existing pharmacy. So that was a little bit of a bonus in that particular project. But in most other projects, you're absolutely right that there are outside influences that um, are often unknown um, and that are occurring in corridors or as uh, you know, someone mentioned elevators, any kind of stack effect that's happening um, and changes in season. And those are un sometimes unknown conditions going into a project. Sometimes they are known and the project may need to um, address those. Um, everything from just beefing up that um, those pressure differentials so that they can um, absorb changes in the adjacent space is one way of doing it. We have been involved in some situations where it just wasn't possible when you have positive and negative spaces and they both reference a common corridor. Um, we've gone to the extent of actually putting in some vestibules in order to really buffer and make sure the airflow direction stays consistently um, in the correct um, direction. So by using the EMS control uh, to control the FS dampers, how did you keep the UI listing and meet life safety codes? Sure, I think I talked about this in the fact that um, the damper and the fire alarm control module um, go in first and then the, the building automation uh, relay uh, comes in uh, downstream so that when the fire alarm cuts damper to the power that that building automation signal goes away as well. So. Okay. Thanks, I think we could sneak in a few more questions here. How can we maintain the pressure of each room if we have diversity around 10% of tower hospitals around the 13th floor? Okay, can you repeat the question one more time to make sure I get all the, mm -hmm. all the components? How can we maintain the pressure of each room if we have diversity around 10% of tower hospitals? And then they put in quotations around the 13th floor. Sure. So um, I, I think the 10% is asking about kind of the acceptable deviance from the design set point. And I would say that in specific cases where you're looking for a pressure requirement or an airflow direction, um, that's something that should be just those places where you're finding that need for that deviation should just be brought up to the engineer of record and likely they will accept those deviations or look for reasons why um, you need they that in order to get the values you need you you are deviating from that initial set point um, oftentimes design engineers um, actually put in kind of a buffer um, when 
pressurization is required because they just, they don't either know exactly how all of the systems are gonna come together. How are the walls and the ceiling, doors and windows in any given space. And so they have to kind of guesstimate the amount of leakage through each of those. And sometimes things are tighter than they expect, sometimes a little bit looser. So I would say that um, it, in reality, that's very normal and just getting acceptance from the design team is the right path. I'd also like to add um, one of the special constraints or one of the um, customized tab specification criteria could be uh, redefining that industry standard. You know, everyone knows kind of plus or minus 10% is kind of the industry standard, but that doesn't mean that has to be applied to every project. I mean, if you have a situation where you really need to be, it could be plus 10%, but you couldn't possibly balance lower. You know, that's something the design engineer could um, specify in order to make sure that any deviations would be actually only helpful for the pressurization. I just want to get this one last question here since two people had related questions. Was money set aside at the beginning of your projects for problem issues as you found on both of them? No, of course not. <laughs> Uh, um, I think there's always when you're working in existing spaces um, and, you know, with the kind of specialty projects, um, unique projects like these, um, there's always some um, money set aside for a contingency. It's never really enough because the amount of things that could be done to make everything perfect um, are endless. Uh, so, in some cases, the owners will go back and say, oh, we've identified this, this component, but it's actually part of a larger project. So we are going to try to put together a case for getting a new project put together, um, like the terminal units that Miles talked about in the first case study is a great example. Um, you know, they are the project helped identify how very poor condition they were in, and then that gave the owner some um, back up to put in for additional funding for a new project. Um, certain things, of course, have to happen as part of the project in order to make it go. In the first case study, we found some of the existing shafts that they were using uh, were not um, up to code in terms of their fire rating. And so that had to be upgraded in order to move on with the project. And that had to come out of a contingency to keep the project moving forward and to be um, approved by the authority having jurisdiction. Hey, thanks so much. That's actually all the time that we have for questions. For those that have unanswered questions, I can send them over to the presenters and they can follow up with you directly. Uh, we hope that you join us next week for our final webinar in the series, Creating a Healthy Workplace in a COVID World, A Better Path Forward. That's on Wednesday, November 11th from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. And thank you so much for everyone at Questions and Answers Engineering for joining us today. Okay. Thank you. Bye, thank everyone. You. Stay safe.